This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Check out the first link in the description to get their $139 a month for three years deal. Okay, after that intro, you might be thinking, why am I even subscribed to this guy? Is all he does make Minecraft every couple years in between building computers? And well, it may look like that, yeah, if you take a look at my channel. But actually, this Minecraft project is a one-off engine tester. I'm actually getting started on a longer term game dev project and thought this could be a fun way to get a 3D engine up and running. So also though, if you remember back to my first video where I said, so I've seen a few other people around YouTube making Minecraft clones, but they all use shortcuts like 3D engines or languages with classes and garbage collection and namespaces and things you don't really need. Well, let's be honest, two years is a long time and I've learned a lot and, and grown a bit. A man's mind can expand and his audio quality can improve in that sort of time. And even though I'm still not the biggest fan of OOP everything, looking at you Java, I think it might be around time to give a language with classes a try. That is C++ of course. I'm not touching anything like C Sharp with a 10 foot pole. Now a lot of you might ask, why write a game and engine in C++ if there are all these other languages that you might like? You might say C++ is old, weird, hard to debug, non-memory safe, it uses exceptions, it's bloated. And while I agree to some degree with you on all of those criticisms, I think maybe that question is better phrased as, why not all those other languages? And I mean, I could make 10 whole videos about a list of all the other things that I didn't like about these languages, their pros and cons, and you know, really turn up the flame war heat in the comments, but to be honest, C++ just beat out all the other languages on maturity and uh, ease of adoption. Even though I'd never implemented anything more than a trivial project in it, it should be easy enough to move from C once I'd worked through all the unique quirks and gotchas, and then it would be smooth sailing after that, right? But anyway, feel free to comment and flame me about how I should have picked your favorite language and tell me why I'm a huge big dumb idiot who should never be allowed near a keyboard because I picked C++. I guess a flame wars will boost engagement anyway. So once I picked out the language, I started from this BGFX cubes example. And you're probably wondering now, hey, I haven't really heard of BGFX. Where is that in the pantheon of DirectX, OpenGL, Vulkan, Metal, and friends? Well, BGFX is a really nice graphics library that actually sits on top of other graphics APIs in order to have code that targets BGFX run on any number of different platforms with ideally minimal changes. It's got a few quirks of its own, of course, but it's been used in a lot of major games, so I think it was good enough for me. So finally, let's dive into the code. Skipping over the boring boilerplate of getting the cubes example set up, like getting a window to show up, communicating with input devices and stuff, well, this thing starts off a lot like my previous video. First, we make a cube, then we make a lot of cubes. Then we make the cubes not show faces which the camera can't see. Then we turn a lot of cubes into a lot lot of cubes using some chunking. And this wasn't all uninteresting, but if you want to know more about the specifics here, just check out my first video. This stuff was basically the same, but with more fighting C++ and getting used to things like templates and Sifine? 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 Uh... Uh, substitution failure is not an error, w whatever that stuff is. Y you can say it took me a few days to get used to programming in C++. But once I ended up getting used to it, I actually ended up really liking programming in C++. Coming from C, of course, having namespaces was super nice, and not having to throw sketchy macros in everywhere was pretty cool too, and the whole thing just feels a little... safer. Also, the last time I tried C++ was in 2012, when C++11 was the most recent version of the language, and I can remember really missing optional types, variants, easier ways to write templates, among other things, which are all things that the language has gained since C++14, 17, and 20. So it's pretty nice to use now, I gotta say. Even if some compilers are missing some of the more recent features. And yes, commenter, before you comment, I know that I'm just eating my words from two years ago, but cut me some slack, I guess. People change. Now you've been able to see in the background here that engine programming was kind of just chugging along, so I was also able to port over the movement code from my old engine really really easily after a few mess ups. But here's where things get different, and the whole reason why I'm writing a new 3D engine for myself. Deferred rendering. That is the solution to, how do I do a bunch of fancy effects and lighting on a big scene without setting my computer on fire? But before we get to the deferred renderer, I want to say a quick few words about the sponsor of this video, Atlas VPN. Now, as an avid internet user, I'm always trying to find the best ways to protect my browsing when I'm surfing around. And the most recent addition to my arsenal of security and speed is Atlas VPN, which is a special deal right now for a three-year plan for just $1.39 a month. 
With Atlas VPN, you can enjoy blazing fast speeds while protecting an unlimited number of devices from ads and malware. And of course, most important of all, you can enjoy Netflix from wherever in the world you want. For me, of course, since I grew up in the US and now live over in Europe, I'm hopping on Atlas VPN all the time to catch up on shows and movies that my friends in the US are talking about, but I can't get to over here in Europe. And for all of you over in the US, you can always check out Canada's Netflix library, which includes things like the Harry Potter movies, The Avengers, and Lord of the Rings. So if all that sounds like a pretty sweet deal to you, be sure to check out the first link in the description to get the $1.39 a month for three years deal while it still lasts. Thanks to Atlas VPNs for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Now to get down to the real business of this whole engine remake thing, deferred rendering. To explain exactly what this is, I'll bust out the pen and paper to explain how it differs from traditional forward rendering. In regular 3D graphics rendering, imagine this situation. We have two objects, A and B, and one light source. From the camera's perspective, one of these objects, B, occludes object A, but when we render, we render A first and B second. All of the pixels of object A, which are eventually overlapped by object B, just had a bunch of expensive lighting calculations done for them, which just got thrown away when we drew B. In the deferred renderer though, we wait to do the lighting calculations until we figured out only what pixels the camera is actually seeing. So we render A and B in whatever order we want, but we only light the pixels which are seen. That's kind of the gist of it, but if you want to know more, check out this article by learnopengl.com, where a lot of my own implementation of this came from. So here are the basics of how that's implemented in the engine. First, we take our traditional scene here and we draw it into three buffers. The depth buffer, showing how far away each pixel is, the color buffer, showing the color of each pixel, and the normal buffer, storing surface normals for each pixel. Now, of course, we can just render out the color buffer here and see our scene as it was, but we want something better. Shadows from the sun. For a little crash course on how real-time shadows work from directional light and 3D graphics, let's draw this out as well. Over here we've got our sun, and then some cube, and then some pixel behind the cube. We're rendering the pixel behind the cube, and we want to find out if it's a shadow or not to determine if, well, it, it should be dark. Well, to do this, we first need to find out what the sun can see. That is, render the scene from the sun's perspective so we have a depth buffer from the sun's point of view. Then when we're doing the lighting calculations from this pixel and we want to find out how light or dark it is, we just take the pixel in the space of the world, transform it into the sun's perspective using some fancy matrices that I'm not going to explain in this video, and then ask if it's further away from the sun or has a higher depth value than the pixel which the sun can already see there. If so, then it's in shadow. I know this might be a little confusing if you've never heard about the technique before, so again, check out this learnopengl.com article if you want a better explanation. Anyway though, once we have that stuff implemented in the engine, and after a few strange bugs are worked around, we have sun shadows. I also implemented a basic technique called PCF to make them look a little nicer around the edges. After this it was time to go all in on some fancy deferred rendering effects. Not all of which I have the time to describe here, but basically in addition to the shadows I added ambient occlusion, again check out the learnopengl.com article for this if you want to know more specular lighting, and a bloom for when that specular lighting gets really intense. And so how does our final scene look? Well, let's look through the layers of the deferred renderer. So first thing we do is we render the world into its basic color, normal, and depth buffers from the camera's perspective. Then we draw the world from the sun's perspective, just into the depth buffer. Then we calculate the lighting for each pixel. Then we calculate the screen space ambient occlusion for each pixel. And then we blur the bloom and ambient occlusion buffers and composite the entire scene together. Simple enough, and all possible due to deferred shading. So now back to Minecraft. The rest of the engine was actually pretty simple from here on out. I just imported the textures that I had for my previous Minecraft project and added a bunch of different block types defined by a few unique properties in the pre-existing tile code that I had. And I gotta say, things do look like they definitely got an upgrade from my old Minecraft clone just through adding these basic blocks and the shadows in AO really do a lot. So with that, it was time to do the last little bit of this engine tester and implement infinite worlds, which are basically just done by tracking the player and making sure that chunks get loaded and unloaded and destroyed at the right times to make sure that there are always enough chunks around the player. Then I could go on to port the old world gen from my previous engine into the current engine. It's got a Minecraft classic-ish sort of look and I really like the way it turns out. And after getting the basic terrain in, I had worlds generating with trees, oceans, and all. Pretty speedy as well, thank you to slapping the O2 flag on my C++ compiler. 
The final thing I wanted to add to wrap up all of my graphical enhancements was a nice water shader. The basic idea here is to use fractional brownian motion with some noise to give smooth normal offsets in the water surface. This is actually the same sort of basic technique that's used in the octave noise in the world generator. This was already easy enough since I already had the water drawing with a separate shader as I'd moved it into a separate mesh from the rest of the world earlier in the development process. And if we check out the code here, you can see that the fractional brownian motion part is a little arcane, but the key here are these normal offsets being given by the water height map at any given time. This code was however adapted from a really nice raycasting water shader on Shader Toy if you want to go check out the original. The link is in the description. And with all that work, this is what our new water looks like. Not too bad for just a few lines of shader code, I think. Now though, it was time to recreate the original house for my very first YouTube video, and to call it for engine development for now. Of course, this Minecraft won't be here to stay. This was basically just a big excuse to get some fancy 3D engine stuff up and running. So expect more game dev videos, more regularly, and soon. Things can go a little faster now that I don't have to implement all my ideas and hardware. Check out the description for a link to all the code on GitHub. And for one last time, be sure to check out Atlas VPN as the first link in the description for a great deal on a fantastic VPN. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you next time. Probably with some more game dev programming.